Oh, we want to record. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have it on your email? email so email it. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah that's better I think what do you think yeah.
Um, so when we asked Will and Gail to collaborate on this, um, we said we want you guys to think about how your work. We came to them because of the sports world, um, but we really wanted to talk to them about where their work came together and where they could collaborate on this. And that's how the idea of It's Personal, the name of the show, came about. And so really, we just wanted to talk a little bit from here from you guys about that moment of when you decided we're going to call this It's Personal. Why that? Because obviously, you are both very personal artists. So, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, Will always makes Gail start to <laughs> And sometimes, like, you know, um, I think, I think literally it was one of the first things that just serendipitously came out of one of our mouths because both of us work from a very, very um, personal place. We create art for ourselves so that we can process the things that we're dealing with, the things that come up against us, the things that our children are dealing with, that our children are dealing with. They're all um, we process through our art, and I think uh, quickly one of the things we talked about on the podcast is that as a young artist, you respond uh, to things that are outside of you. You, uh, you reference them, and you try to absorb and, and decide what you're supposed to do art about. And as you get older, it becomes very apparent what's important to you. And nothing out there matters anymore. And everything that's in here matters more. <laughs> it's like, okay, I know this feel I gotta clean this up. And so I gotta do art about it. I have to clean this up for me, I have to clear it up for anybody else who's doing something similar. So uh, I think you were talking about what what makes you do art? Well, it's very personal. It's what we are processing and why we are processing it. We end up getting bigger and more intense and more abstract and, and all that sort of stuff. So that that's just to add a little to that, I, uh, in a time of after COVID, we all have our own personal challenges, right, and, and debates and, <clears throat> and struggles. And so, when Gail and I were talking about the show, we really wanted or wanted to express ourselves as, as authentically as possible, and and really kind of release some of these issues and ideas that we've all been working on, and some good and bad. So what you'll see here is a lot of positive and some negative, but you know, it's personal is a very important title for not only the show, but how we live through life, because we have to recognize that, you know, it's not easy for us to kind of just float and, and take things for granted and for us to really grow and achieve our, um, you know, our authentic self, so you have to go through the darkness and so you can see the light. And so we have our own personal journey and how we did that. And hopefully tonight we will talk a little about some of these pieces and how we got there. Well, that's a great segue because what is, I think the best kind of place to start here is black on black. Can everyone hear me? But it's black and black because I think the conversation, you know, we spent a lot of time with Will and Gail over uh, the past month. We do have a podcast that we'll, we'll tell you guys where that is at the end, uh, but we learned a lot about them. But one of the most interesting things that I learned is when you started this process um, for your black and black and what the emotions you were feeling and you talked a little bit about how it brought you back to how you felt when your parents divorced so you want to talk a little bit about that uh i, I mean that's always hard i guess you know i think the concept of where you're going covid kind of triggered a lot of things i thought i conquered and overcame and you know um in that one moment that lisa's talking about is um is this idea of abandonment and being a young boy at nine in 1979 and being going through a divorce with family, it was painful, obviously. And I was one of the few families in my town that that happened to. So I was confused and obviously um, totally um, alone. And COVID, which I didn't know, triggered this moment that brought me back there. And how did I do that? We all we all went back to our problems and we were all um, trying to figure out this this new this new life 
For me, I went right to my studio and I drove from my studio every day in peace. But I locked myself into this my vessel. And that vessel um, became this place of uh, awakening because I didn't even know I had these demons and these these uh, challenges and and these things I haven't really dealt with. And I was painting all these dark pieces, and I was so confused, and I didn't understand what was going on. And I was, am I blaming on COVID, or what's really going on? What's happening? And what was really happening was I was reflecting on my life and saying, well, what, what do we do now? Now what? Why am I going here? How do I get out of this darkness? And what you're seeing here, and what Lisa brought this up, is this that I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to deal with that. I didn't want to come to this new place of enlightenment with that moment in my time. But the only way to do that is to go to a, a, a place of, of understanding was me to, to deliver these dark pieces so then I can kind of find the light again. But that took months and I was alone. Gail came in there three times and in. She's like, what are you doing? I have been locked in here. This is like everything. I walk, I walk my doors, I walk the canvases everywhere. I was like, that is not me. And then I was like, what? Like, I can do well. Like, what? What's going on over here? And I, and I said, I'm here. But I said, I have to go through this. You gotta, I don't, I, I just have to experience it. And I, and I have to address it. And so everybody has to address their own kind of fears. And my fear 100% was this moment of, I want to go back to that 10 year old boy and say, it's okay. Uh, it's okay you know, to feel that because I don't want to be triggered by that. I was talking to I dad. I want to move through that. And the only way to do that for me was pain. And so, how I got through that was I was praying and I was calling my angels and I was like, hey, I, I don't know what to do. And they're saying, no, that was able to. At least launch into this whole new series of work with your kind of same thing. So I'll stop there, but I think I wanted to bring you into the fold. It's not all fancy and nice and beautiful. It's mm -hmm. there's a lot of things I, I didn't know I had not darkness inside me that, that was very insecure and I was fearful and, and I was I had a lot of hatred and I didn't like that. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate that. So Gail, all of your work is very personal to you, but tell us about, we haven't directly asked you this question yet, but of all of the pieces in this show, talk to me about the one that's the most personal to you. And I know that's a hard question because they're all so different. Mm -hmm. We know the story on part of me, and, and so my mind goes there for you, but is there something else in this show that is really that personal to you? You know, you know they're all for, I don't know, my first one is because I'll cry. <laughs> but, you know, pretty much everything comes from something. We all relate to each other, right? So, even as artists, and, and like Will said, when you do a dark piece, not only does it heal you, but you connect with all the people that have been in that dark place too. And that's what's beautiful about dark pieces. They're not, um, you know, what's interesting is somebody. Commented on one of our posts the other day and said, Why well, is everything about suicide? And I looked around the room and I'm like, everything is not about suicide. <laughs> but, um, but people will, will come to the table with what they need to receive so that they heal or process. And it's, it's one of the beautiful things is you, you never want to be alone, right? To whatever it is that you're dealing with, um, to know that somebody else wants to feels that. So, I don't know which, I mean, I, it kind of falls around. You felt suspended and completely helpless. And that's bringing the piece back there with the guys hanging in that abyss. That's, that's not as, um, it's more of a frustrating place to be than, than a personally devastating place to be. I've done stuff you know, on the spectrum, and not always because of me, but I'm an empath. So if my kids hurt me, I feel that pain. <laughs> My friends are hurting my feeling, but um, probably the most recent and powerful, uh, deeply emotional piece is that, like you said, because we all relate to when our kids leave. That's literally for lots of people, it's very different. I've had a number of people completely read that as um, as as someone's soul, the, the transparent cube. But to me, it was my children, 
and it, it's removable. And then it starts walking around the earth, and it's, it's like, wait, that's part of my body. <laughs> you can't go. But um, so, so that's about my kids uh, sort of flying with him from being being free at the same time as me feeling like there's this massive void that I want to come fill with them again. But for other people, it's either the loss of self or the loss of soul, or the fact that your soul is transparent. And what's happening to it is all a reflection of everything that's around it. So, so it's really cool how people receive stuff. But yeah, I mean, I really need it. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Everything's <laughs> totally, totally something that's happened. Yeah. You know, there's so much to unpack here. And so I feel like we're going to rewind yeah. a little bit because, you know, there, there's, they are so interesting. We could make this three hours. So there's so much that. I want to talk about like each piece in here, but there are things about them that I want you to know that I think are so interesting. And one of them is that Will was commissioned by the Broncos to do the portrait of Peyton Manning that sits in Mile High Stadium. And what I loved about that story is the process of how you did that. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Process. Yeah. First of all, working with um, Peyton Manning is such a joy. I don't know if anybody's met him. We've all seen him play, but he is a he's a stand-up individual, and he's very inspiring. So, and very tall. My wife Amy was there, and she looked at him and like, "Oh, he's so tall." I was like, "Just calm down." But the, the process was really interesting with that. I'm an abstract painter. And um, the Broncos organization wanted to capture a moment, a unique moment about Peyton Manning, of him in the moment of battle on the line. What does that feel like? What does that mean? How do you translate those emotions out of canvas? And what does it really look like? So what was very interesting was the concept of um, you know, the Broncos organization had this idea like, okay, can't wait to see Peyton on the line, throw the ball looking great. I was like, that's so obvious. That's too easy. We don't want that. And I know Peyton didn't want it. So the process was the Broncos hired me to come down and, and create this, this tribute piece for him that's now in the, um, it's in the Broncos stadium. But what was really special was how it all came. I met Peyton and I brought the canvas, the sacred canvas, down to this locker room, the sacred locker room of the Denver Broncos, <laughs> where the carpet is like $2 million. Don't <laughs> touch the Broncos carpet. It was completely, and here I am with this painting, this painting with an easel. And though the concept was I wanted to meet Peyton, we wanted to be in his place. His sacred place and talk about this experience and listen, listen. So the canvas was set up with harps everywhere, and um, next thing you know, I'm at I'm, I'm in front of the canvas and Hayden way down there coming through the locker room. I'm like, oh, he looks pretty, you know, I just said pretty tall, and he gets closer and closer and closer and closer. <laughs> I am teat. Field 
And that's where all the magic is happening. And pain can say, all right, let me tell you about this. Let me tell you how it focus. Let me tell you about the shot clock. Let me tell you about where, I, where I'm working, who I'm staring at, and where I get the focus. And so that was really neat because you know, here is this individual that knew how to command his ship and his team in the moment of chaos. He's like, that's what I want to capture. I want to capture, you know, this creates this creative moment of chaos and really bring it to the um, to the canvas so everybody can still sort of see it. So great. We talk now, it's like, okay, go do it. So we bring the canvas in then and we use all of we load up the U-Haul and we head off to Boulder and bring the canvas back to my studio. I start painting and I start painting mud. And I'm like, this is not going great. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe I should ask for some help. And that's where I was very fortunate to have Dale, who is right next to me. And I said, yeah, well, I need some guidance here. I don't know. I thought I knew how to do this. And she was very informative and very critical. And very <laughs> like, this is terrible. So we use a fortune because, you know, there's a dialogue in anything you do. And part of the, the whole story is, you know, how do you put yourself out there when you think you know how to do something and then you show up and you try it and it's, it fails? I was failing. And, um, but I don't know that you were. So but it's, it's a, yeah. Because they knew that they came to you because you paint magic. Like you paint what stuff feels like. And they really had the guts to go for that. And then they kind of chickened up. Yes. Right? So, right. <laughs> and they knew that you did that. And then they were like, well, where's Peyton? Where's Peyton? Where's the number? Where's the subject? <laughs> oh, he's in there. He's in one of the circles. Well, no, no, no. no. We give you an element. Yeah, but you know, it's kind of always a game, but give it. <laughs> so, and, that, and that's important because I'll try to this quick. It, it, the moment was like, really, how do you capture the spirit, the energy, the, the element? And, and I did. And, and that was because I, I needed some guidance. I need to talk through this because I'm in my silo, <clears throat> my vessel, the studio. And I, I, was just, I was in a rush. And Gail was able to add some amazing monetary guidance. And, and once the painting came alive, it was like magical. And uh, then we did the reveal at my studio. And that's where my wife was there and a few other people. And, uh, and he walked in and we had a totally blanket up. And you can see it also mm -hmm. ripped it off the canvas. And we didn't have our measure on us. And we loved it. And then that's the moment of truth. That's the full element of complete vulnerability. And I knew we captured that. And it was a team effort. And so, you know, that was one of the highlights of really capturing the human spirit and, and putting yourself in a place of, of uncertainty, but knowing that we all have the ability to overcome that and accomplish greatness. So we know that Gail, that Will, is a master of capturing energy. And I want to show you guys something because I want you to see what Gail does in her captured energy. Gail's gonna help with this. So this piece is called Tata Pet. This is the second in a full of nine of these, the first being in the permanent collection at the Denver Art Museum. So Tata Tet meaning head to head. So I want you guys to see the dialogue between these two figures. Nobody knows that these move, and they were designed to move. So Gail's capturing of energy right here. If you read the catalog, you'll see that these spaces are like a Roman joinery here, that they fit into one another. So you see this couple, this friendship, whatever this is, staring at each other here. And when we turn them, we did this earlier this week and we just loved it. Let's turn her. So we're gonna turn her this way. Now, look at how this energy and this dialogue between these two figures has changed just by doing that. So I want you to tell us a little bit about the piece. Looking at this was yes, read at this too. Now again, they've gone from mad at one another to introspective about Will's amazing piece behind it. So what I love about Gail's work is her ability to capture that energy also. And I want you if you're willing to tell the crowd about your experience. It's kind of every artist's dream to be part of a permanent collection at a museum. 
And with this being that piece, talk them through how that came together and how it came to be a banana. All right. Well, um, oh, can I hold this up? Um, it, it, it is an honor, of course, to have any of your pieces in our museum or, or even a show like this. Thank you both for, for that. Uh, but this piece is the piece that Christoph Heinrich picked. Um, of course, uh, it's, it's often the papers or collectors that, that push them in front of the boards that. Um, that are the people that choose or or you want to support different artists and introduce you to people that are in the know and what have you. Anyway, uh, I, I, I had a, a very fortunate opportunity that one of my collectors and patrons introduced me to, to, to the Denver Art Museum, and then they, of course, get to decide if this art is cut or not. I'm sure whatever, until we have a look, no, we can't say yes or anything. <laughs> but um, they had a look and they, they decided that. Was worthy. So uh, Crystal and, and Arthur Michekovich came up to the studio and, and they looked at my um, body of work. And this particular piece, of course, I mean, small. I do all my art on a reasonable size. <laughs> the bronze is crazy expensive when it gets this big. <laughs> but um, he saw this piece and it intrigued him because of the change in the dialogue. And in the place in particular that they were talking about having it, uh, it had a crazy, you all are familiar with the Red Grooms. Piece that's out in the balcony at the Denver Art Museum. It's crazy Indians shooting in cowboy hats and colors and mayhem. And, and the fact that they could look out the window at this bizarre, bizarre <laughs> thing, he thought it was funny. The dialogue changing was really intriguing. Um, the, the interesting thing that happened therein was when they commissioned it um, to happen, once it got there, the curatorial staff was like, well, nobody could touch it. <laughs> so the whole point was to change that dialogue. Right? You're looking at people coming through with this thing, I'm like, don't come in here. Um, and Mike and I used to joke about they would be angry parents or arguing. You, know, like, you look at the TV and you look at you, look at the TV. Um, and, um, it, was, it was just funny because we played the dialogue a lot. And the fact that people appreciated that was part of the intrigue of the piece. And it was going to be a museum or one. It and they were they were <laughs> committed to the docents changing the position every day so that we never got it through, which looked different. But people didn't stop touching it, so we eventually just threw the towel on I just I felt like I was <laughs> because it's really fun to put their hands on and stuff like that. But um yeah, that's that's sort of where that came from. We know we all um, see art differently. I saw marriage, right? <laughs> Didn't we know that there's married out there? So that you know, we kind of go throughout our day. I'm going to turn that lights on. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you know, the other thing that I thought would be interesting for you to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is what the word about the museum. Yes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 so you know, actually last night I learned the interesting story of actually how do you got your piece in veil. So anybody who skis in the yeah, and has nice. seen that amazing sphere in the circle in veil, um on scales. And but the the way that you got selected in there, I thought found so interesting. So Touch on that. Okay, me too. You can go. I'm just <laughs> gonna go. We got plenty of All right. All right. Um, the the nutshell version of that was they were really uh, they have a beautiful board of really great curators and people in the know that they bring together to choose what goes into the veil collection, which is really nice for a public art collection. Because they people they pick people like you, not just anybody, to decide whether it's cool or not. But people who really collect art and are familiar with contemporary work. And and they'll, they'll go a little bit outside of what, what's totally safe and comfortable, which is awesome. Um, like Ken Logan and, and so on. But it, uh, they wanted, for this one particular piece, they wanted a really recognized artist that would bring people from all over the world. And my, my, uh, the guy who I show with, Bill, he's on the art public list, so he was on the board. So um, not only was it a sort of, um, Non incestuous, but like he couldn't really pre 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 present me because I showed with him. But at the same time, my piece it was about the World Cup and the Olympic athletes, skiers. And he said, This doesn't, you know, fit any of the criteria that you guys have called for a famous artist, uh, 
a recognized person you will draw from all over. Really, nobody knows this person. I've never done any big or monumental or public art, but this piece is exactly what you're talking about. And you put it on the table in front of everybody in London. No, unbeknownst to me, they all were like, well, yeah. And um, then he, he asked me to do a model of it. Most of you people are not paying attention to a lot of your skis, so they'll pull themselves up the poles and skis and walking under it and all that. I said, well, yeah, that would be like model it up, come up to Vail, show me. There's just a long shot. We're going to kind of show it to somebody. I was like, okay. Um, and there was nobody else presenting. I didn't realize that. There were probably 12 people in the room that they didn't introduce me to. So I, I, I did my little book song dance and I sat down and I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and then the guys came back and said, That's awesome, let's do it. Anyway, I didn't tell them I'd never done any more skill work until it was done. <laughs> but it was, it was awesome for me to do that, as I said, three pieces of curators and collectors, it was awesome for him to take a chance on me to put my work in front of the people uh, so they could see it. Otherwise, you know, you could. We yell out loud from the top of the mountain. Nobody's <laughs> listening unless <laughs> there's somebody else. But it was that that was quite interesting. Well, we promised you guys that we talked about some of the art in here as well, and we touched on some of it. But talking about we're sitting and standing on this quote behind us, this art is a conflict with the sublime nature of our shared existence. And that is something that Gail uses on her website. And when I saw that on there, I pulled it. I didn't quite do it. I was like, this is going to buy on the wall. Um, the reason being, if you look at the piece in the center of the gallery, and you look at this incredibly large stone canvas that is behind it, and the people who are over here to my right get the best view because this was strategically designed for parents who could look through the sculpture at the canvas. Um, so the one in the center is called Universal Consciousness, that's Gail's sculpture, and then the canvas on the wall called Entanglement. And I want the two of them to talk about this, but this piece, they all speak to this quote, but this piece and the way these two artists describe it together really speaks to this sublime nature of our shared existence. So I would love for the two of you to give us kind of this breakdown of how that came to be together. And I know you can do it because you've done it before and then I wrote about it. So. You know, I think that the dialogue will change. I, I see it differently in the space. Really? Yes. I like uh, that. So I know we did a podcast and talked about this relationship between the sculptures right behind you in the center room. But in general, to me, entanglement and universal consciousness is, is really this wonderful play on, on how we live and walk through life. It's we try to connect to a um, you know a higher being and try to connect your consciousness to something that's hopefully positive. But in the meantime, we're all entangled with all these different layers of fear, challenges, uh, distractions. And you know, for me, that painting really, I painted that before. Um, Gail and I were talking about this whole collaboration, and one of the things I love about it is I look at it now, it, it's kind of it's changing on me, and I'm maybe maturing as I look at my own at that life, it's teaching me something. So I started out with that coming with the idea as I'm a former architect and I love to draw, and this entanglement was really about. How we interact with our own space, and it's almost looking at a top view, um, you know, of, of an individual. Like how you walk through the day, how you how do you process information? And and back in the day, when architects used to redline things, and they still do on their computers now. It it used to draw these amazing shapes and these formats of the redlining things that don't work or they don't make sense. And I wanted to simplify. How our past might cross, and sometimes the past that don't work. Um, so if you look at it differently, they may not work at that moment, but over time, you see all these different um, passageways and these different voids, and the uniqueness in that piece is sort of seeing how things do open up, and we do intersect and we do intertwine. We are entangled all the time, but our goal is to find those openness. And the beauty and the whiteness in there is really trying to show the purity of the past that we do have the possibility.
possibility every day to find joy and love. And that's tapping into universal consciousness. And so that's how it mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> okay. Um so I have to start with these crazy um prompts that my kids gave me in an unbelievable special they gifted me for Christmas that had uh very esoteric or, or abstract concepts on the page that they were copying and sketching for every day. I find myself like now draw something about it. Consciousness. Oh, <laughs> 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 All right, then we can think here and they don't I like that stuff. And we had a great conversation. I think it's a book of books, uh, not just young toys, but it, they, it was a really cool um, task. It was a whole book. Of, 200 different prompts that were very abstract, very heavy, and, the, and their challenge was to draw something every day that, that, that expressed these abstract ideas, which is really what we're doing all the time. But to have prompts was really a pleasure. But um, um, at the same time, I'm, I've been for I don't know how many years talking about uh, and practicing a sort of a form of meditation. And once in a while, when you get lucky and you really do that transcendent thing where you feel like universe and flash of light and it all goes like this. Wow, wow. What does that look like? How do I describe that? Combined with the fact that I know what it feels like when somebody walks into a room that doesn't have good energy. And I know what it feels like when somebody walks into a room that does have good energy. And all these things coming together, I want to know how to explain that or how to describe it or how to break it down so that I can understand it better, so that I can be aware of how I'm affecting people and how everybody's affecting me so that maybe I can be a little more proactive about not being affected since I am so sensitive. Um, to the people that are negative, the people that, that can that can send out those jagged feelings that and can I affect them positively before they affect me negatively. What's what is that? And how do we draw that? And if I was coming from the same place that I came from, if I was to affect people to consider that, consider what their energy is, looks like, and is doing to everybody else, where would it be? And it, it, it was a sketch that looked a lot like this that ended up with a, a small scale model that I scribbled up in one night with bailing and hay bailing wire, and then thought, I don't do this that size. And Followed around until I found out how well they're crazy enough to let me take over the studio <laughs> and wipe out everything in the room with these 20 foot rods. I gotta bend this way. I don't try to do that. It is fine. But um, it was really fun because I, to me, that's what it looks like. When you're walking past anybody on the street, we are affecting our energy is big, much bigger than we realize. And, and it, it connects with every other energy. And if you really are aware of it, all our you know, we're all connected. Yeah, all the plants, all the all the life, all the inanimate, all the, everything is connected, and the whole universe is connected. If we get it together a little bit more and figure that out, we can stop affecting each other negatively. Because um, really, we're all just exactly the same thing. We're these these creatures with two legs walking around, and we're all human. And it doesn't matter any of the snap on parts, like that piece of my favorite parts of the gallery, they hey, they're allowed to. You know, you can have some of these, none of those, or whatever. It's all just you, it's one tribe, and we're all connected. And that was sort of an, uh, an experiment with what does this look like and how, how can I put it in the world to start? So, what is, you know, what is so interesting is that when we started talking to you guys, our theme for 2020 and 2021 was all about collaboration. And I gotta tell you, it was not an easy process to find people that wanted to collaborate or that could collaborate. It's so sad. You know, it was like you have to have like this chemistry and this synergy to be able to do that. And what's remarkable is that you guys have never collaborated before. <clears throat> um, so but so there's so many parts to this question, but the, the biggest part that I want people to know is that all of this artwork here was artwork that you had. You didn't create for this exhibit. 
you created this exhibit together with your artwork. Right. So this is two parts. First part is um, how you did that. And the part I think that drew so many people to this show was passion, yeah. uh, which is kind of that the back here, everybody, if you want to turn around, it's so beautiful. And it was obviously the centerpiece that we used to promote the show. So talk to me a little bit about this. You know, each break those down for me. And well, why don't you see? Okay. Let me take a deep breath here. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the pain. So um, let me first of all talk about Gala and collaboration. We have, you remember, our studios are together, are uh, in the same warehouse. So maybe we take it for granted that we do talk about our projects. We necessarily haven't had a group show like this, but we've done shows in our studios and exhibits. With that said, I've really been fortunate to. Um, have a creative spirit that works next to me, who I trust. And, and purely on this level of human spirit, I say I'm thankful for that. Who's honest, who calls me out, um, <laughs> who sometimes you know they put me in a place where like, hey, this is crazy, I don't understand it. And it's nothing wrong. It's just we all have different dialogues with different people, and we have to embrace that. And I I was fortunate because I maybe needed a little smack sometimes, you know. <laughs> so, but right now I'm going to talk a little about this painting passion, and it is that one was created recently. It's the most recent painting I did about two months ago, and why I love that so much and how it kind of um, sings with Gail's sculpture is that that was purely. You know, painting something from a totally different vantage point. That canvas was raw, totally unprimed, on the on the floor, painted it upside down. And if you look closely, without giving all the secrets away, I wrote the word love. And I don't know why and how, but remember, I painted that upside down. L O B E is in there. And what's really unique with the L sculpture is that it's very soft. There's a that that type of pink and mauve is one of the purest colors that the human experience for describing what love really feels like in the universe. And it reflects and radiates so well from the reflection of the sculpture. And what I love about the sculpture and that painting is that it's got these really hard edges sometimes, but it's, it's so soft as it reflects with her, her choice of material. And the voids between her the two bodies and the forms kind of really relate so well to that canvas that it brings it alive. And I, without us really pairing this up and, and talking about it, you know, the, the black lines and some of those shapes really kind of depict the way that she moved through her, her sculpture and I think her narrative on that. And it, it's just magical. And I'm grateful that she, you know, we were able to put these pieces together and she helped curate this. And that's, I mean, I, I hope you're all moved by that because I, you know, I want you to touch it and I want you to feel that energy and that vibe because that's what Gail was sort of talking about. We're trying to highlight this high level emotion that exists in all of us. And we're just trying to channel that to allow that experience to reach to many people. And the passion is really what we wanted to accelerate and uh, make sure we bring to you know, bring to the space. So. I love you being able to talk about your piece as well, but what you made me think of, well, and we've said this throughout this year of collaboration, the thing that I think has been most special for Lisa and I in this process of watching artists collaborate is where we can look at that and see two pieces of art that came out of two different studios. When they come together, it's almost as if a third piece of art has been created. And we've said that about this process of collaboration. It doesn't have to be two people working on the same canvas, but when those pieces are speaking to one another from where they were created, you see this third piece of art that's come to life. But tell us about heat and sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go. Um, so one of the things that I think is interesting about this, especially since uh, 
it's almost like this filter is a gateway drug to the abstract. Because a lot of people don't know how to approach abstract art. And, I, and my husband's an architect, and I learned this, um, this sort of class course uh, exercise that I do. I've always I've done with a lot of students from one of his architecture teachers. If you get a whole group of people and you hand them a pencil and a bunch of paper, you say you have three seconds to describe in a line without any diagrammatical stuff that's recognizable these different emotions, and you go through like anger. Everybody, you say anger, but somebody with a pencil in their hands will grab it like this, but scribble on the page. Anger looks similar to all of us. It would be really unusual for somebody to draw others other than something hard and, and screw it. And then if you say peace, people will always go horizontal, like the like the horizon. And, and, and that's a really great way to <clears throat> assess why we change tools, patterns, colors, textures. In my sculpture, if I'm doing adrenaline in sports, there's a lot of angles and hard lines because the adrenaline is really intense. But if it's sensuality you're talking about and that heat is about the sort of tension between two people, that that's a sensual, softer line thing. And so there's reason for all the artists picking the way, the what, and the, the everything that, they, that you're choosing when you're making a piece of art. And if you look a little deeper, you can start to interpret that however you interpret it. And you'll bring your own interpretation to the table, and that's the beauty of it. But the art that's a little too literal it doesn't leave anything open to your imagination or your connection with it. So the beauty of both his work and my work, I think, is that it's open to interpretation. It is a, it's, it's sort of a, it's a few of the words of the whole narrative. It's not the whole narrative. And, and that's the kind of art I like. It leaves it wide open. And, and so you can look at it and get like that gentleman that said, why did they think about suicide? You know, what you see is very different than what the next person sees. And that's, that's what it should be. It should connect with you, and you might not even know why it connects, but it will. And it might be because your room was painted that color when you were two. <laughs> you know, who knows? But if something connects with you, that's why they say, what is it? But you guess what this non is? You can't dispute what somebody resonates with because it's personal, and, and, and you can't help it. But you, and you might not know why, but stuff will connect with you. That's the conduit thing. And that's what you hope to do when you're creating something, right? You just make stuff that feels right to you because it feels like what you're trying to assess and assimilate and process and get out of your system or, or relive sometimes. Depends if it's very bad. <laughs> um, but that's sort of where all these things come from. So heat, the heat is just, you know, that's why it's, it's mushy as opposed to being made after it's stuff that can be something with the vibration. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have. See, there's so much to talk about, and the time just kind of flew. So, um, we we have a couple paintings left that we can definitely talk about. Uh, we want to leave time for Q and A for the audience to ask some questions. Um, and so, you know, did well before we bring it to the audience, we have not talked about angels singing. Um, which is behind part of me. So, do you want to talk about that quickly before we go on to the question from the audience? Sure. Uh, angels singing. So, I know earlier in my talk, I, I described a little darkness being in my, uh, in my cave. And after kind of challenging myself and putting myself in that position of uncertainty and painting a lot of dark black and um, other crazy canvases. I sat and just started, you know, praying and meditating and I was calling my angels and I said, I need to shift. I need, I want to start finding light again. I want to be, I want to be positive. I want to, I want to project a very different narrative to the world because everybody is, everybody is, yelling and there's so much noise and no one's listening anymore and i sat there and said enough i i want to i want to go in a different direction 
And so that is the first painting that I painted after my my um, my fear, and that sort of lifted my hopes. And I've never painted those colors before. And that was painting number one that changed and reset my my interpretation of how I want to start living in this world. And for me, that became as they call it a renaissance. Because each one of us needs to find to re, you know, be reborn, reset, and relook at our our approach to life. And this painting is really about engulfing the, the one the spirit of earthly life for yourself in this moment where the angels start singing around you and, and protecting you and guiding you and lifting you up and feeling pure love and joy. Don't you want that? I do. And so this is a, a moment that I'm always going to remember and reflect on and say, we all have it in us to find the pure joy that exists that we can share with the world. And this is my first interpretation of how I want to do that. Thank you for that. So I wanted to talk to Zoom for one minute because I don't even think we're ignoring you. All of the people here are, are able to sit and look at each of these pieces as we've been talking about them. We wanted you to know if you go to CAA's website, which is evergreenarts.org, right from the center on the homepage, it's the It's Personal button, which shows passion and heat as sort of our signature piece that we've been showing off. If you click on that, it will take you to a page where the catalog for everything that's in the gallery is online so that you can look at these pieces up close as individual pieces, as well as the combination, that sort of third piece of art where the two pieces come together. It also has all the descriptions in there of these. Um, we will also do, we haven't done it yet, if you're on Instagram, I did a walkthrough today, but it's very brief probably feel very tipsy when you watch it <laughs> really fast so i will go back through and do another one a little bit slower so that anybody who's on instagram who feels like they can't be in the gallery but they want to be can take a look and see these in person i will also do what you don't know on zoom that these people are privy to is that this show extends beyond the walls of this gallery that we're sitting in we were so fortunate that will and kale not only after they created these pairings um, brought up additional pieces of Work that Lisa and I had the honor of getting to pair with one another. So I think we have 11 more sculptures of Gales and seven more paintings of Wills that extend out into the rest of our facility here. And we'll make sure we get those online in some sort of video format so you can see those as well. Um, but really, you guys came because we wanted to see if any of you had any questions. So if anybody in here has a question, if anybody on Zoom has a question, we'll man the chat there. So you won't know. Poor Jordan is running back and forth. It's like a crazy person because I keep telling her things. Um, so does anybody in here have any questions no. that Will or Gail can answer at the time? Um, I do think so. I'm so curious how you, what tools you use uh, to do this work and how you, I just don't know enough about any of this. I'm, I'm so Not curious. That's, that's a totally valid question. Um, a lot of people, this is lost wax cast bronze. So I don't work in metal, I work in clay. And me personally, I prefer an oil based clay. It never dries and you can't do anything permanent with it. So I make, uh, and I, I, for anything big, I sculpt it in a more malleable, smaller scale, so you can really make big changes. Because once you get this size, your armatures are pretty fixed. If you weld an armature in place, you can't decide how long it's like two inches bigger, four inch bigger. So if I make something small and really love it, or, or have a, a couple of paper clients say make it big, um, then I can point it up, and then I can rearrange at will until I get it right, and I can sculpt it again. But any any lost wax cast bronze is sculpted originally in clay of some sort or other on an armature, and the tools are are usually a paring knife. I have all the scars. <laughs> I have all the tools in the book. I spent much money on all the fancy tools, but I always go for my knife. And sometimes it's uh, a, a basic stucco, what do you call it, palette, uh, a knife for drywall. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Come by the studio. I will. I will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. I mean, all of this.
this is so fascinating. And I, I just want to say that I sat here and stared at that. And it brought me such peace. I mean, I can totally get with the whole COVID thing. And that is just, it just brought tears to me. It's just mm -hmm. wonderful. Did I hear, did Zoom meet? Do we have questions on Zoom? We do not yet, no. Does anybody else in the audience have a question? It beeped, but it was from before. <laughs> Yes, yes. I have a question about the time. Like, how long do you spend to make a painting like that? It's the same time for you. Like, you have to stand together. What's the amount of time do you spend on, on making these pieces? Um, I think it really depends. It varies. It depends on the mood, the emotions, and for what show and how big my paintings are. I mean, I, I, I don't want to expose all the magic, but I mean, I can, if I'm really tuned in and, and I'm flowing with creativity, I can do a painting, you know, in an hour. And it might be awesome. But these, during the time of COVID, took a long time to uncover the story of what that canvas wanted to tell to the world. So it, it's interesting because remember, Gail and I know, but it doesn't just happen. Creativity comes when you are ready to receive. And how do you do that? You have to be in the right place, the right mindset, and you have to um, be ready to act on it. And so my wife knows sometimes I get up a little early and uh, four in the morning and I get her a little early. I'm like, it's acting, I gotta get out. And she's like, there's someone pulses. I know, I'm sorry. I go. So it, it happens to all of us, but to me, I think your question really is, um, it's very important because there is no one right way that I approach my paintings. I approach them with having an open heart and making sure I get out of the ego and I say, all right, what do you want me to do today? And that's how that painting came about. I never painted these colors. People give my entire portfolio. That didn't happen. But I was I was asking to be guided. And that's what showed up. And then I knew there was a whole body of work in there. And I was like, okay, I'm ready for those next couple of weeks. I got up early, kept waking my wife up and my kids. <laughs> She's like, I'm not. So I think you have to, there are prompts in all of our lives and you make a choice are you going to act on it or not and as i've developed as an artist i'm seeing these prompts are really turning into larger narratives and more stories to be told and that to me is more special and i'm changing and and that was been fun to share with gail because you've seen me go from this one person to something very different and i get to see her change too in a way that's very powerful and I think that's what's important as, as we all relate to our friends or our spouses and husbands. And you want to encourage them to change and, and, and be challenged by the blank canvas. The blank canvas is very scary. And every day I wake up, I have to get a blank canvas. And I don't care if you're an architect designing a project, you have a blank screen. You know, and it's really incredible how creative people manage to frame these amazing stories so they can create and communicate with the world. And, uh, well, Will, you have like prompted me into the segue of our podcast, um, Facing <laughs> the Blank Canvas. And I want to give a shout out to Tom Hutz because he <laughs> does our podcast. <laughs> Everyone. So if you had, have not had the opportunity to tune in to our podcast, you can learn so much more because we really talked. So our conversation was very different on our podcast. So if you're interested in learning more, please tune in. It is on our website um, and you can tune in to Facing the Blank Canvas. I also want to thank everybody for joining us. And, you know, this is, we are so proud of this show. I, I mean, you worked really hard and Sarah worked so closely with them to find the narrative of this whole 
beautiful exhibit that we have. So I encourage all of you all to take a few minutes and, and just absorb it all. And everything is for sale. So don't be afraid. <laughs> you can buy it there. You can buy it there. or sculpture, they're available for that. So once again, thank you to our sponsor, because she was not here earlier, Alexa Kelly. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for making this happen, and thank you all for joining us. So thank you. Enjoy the exhibit. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Linda.